Hello, my name is Nicole Schroen and I am the Disability Coordinator for the City of Portland. We created this training video to help you be better prepared in emergencies and disasters. We invited some of our friends along to help us out in each of the scenarios, but we couldn't cover everything. And so we've also included a workbook. I'll come back after each of the clips and we'll review the lessons that we learned in each of the scenarios. I'm here! Can I help you? Oh, yes. Let's see. I'm here to cause mayhem, chaos, and absolute panic. And no, I don't have an appointment. I wasn't really expecting you, but come in. Okay, let's see. What are we I think we have a problem here. What if I were to block the exit? Oh my god! She stopped! What are we gonna do? No problem. No problem? You can't leave! I don't want to go anywhere for several hours. There could be aftershocks. And anyway, this building has been seismically retrofitted. Seismically retrofitted? What? Oh, she's here. Who's here? Come on. You're calm. You got a plan. So obvious. Oh, you mean preparedness. Hello, emergency. <laughs> We were just talking about you the other day. Oh, my face. Yeah, I admit it. I was nervous about meeting you. But since I'm prepared, you're not as scary as I thought. Bet you didn't think about this. You're in a wheelchair. How are you going to get out of here? Sure, I may be alone now, but I have people in my emergency support group who can help me. Emergency support what? Emergency support group. It's a group of people that Nicole's identified ahead of time to help out in case you show up. Yeah, I actually have a contact list here on my emergency kit with everyone's name and number. And I've actually already made a plan with one of my co-workers that knows I'm here in case... An emergency. What if your co-worker can't get here? I've got this. doing is blowing her whistle in a repetitive pattern. First responders know to listen for that. All right, you got a whistle. But there's no electricity, and you have a power chair. Batteries are not going to last forever. I have this handy device that lets me charge my wheelchair batteries, plugging it into my car lighter. Oh, cool. Can you charge your phone with it? Uh-huh. How about a laptop? Sure. A microwave? <laughs> no. No microwave? Well then how are you gonna eat? We actually keep a 72 hour kit in the office. It's filled with food and water. I'm hoping that I don't have to be here that long 
and I'll be able to get somewhere that there is power. Well, don't you have a plan with the person from your emergency support group to meet in a designated area? I do. We prearranged a spot. Sounds like you're prepared for this emergency. Oh, you're not so bad. <laughs> no, he's not. My work here is done. In this scenario, we learned about earthquake preparedness. Specifically, we learned about some of the obstacles and challenges someone who is both using a wheelchair and who is electrical dependent might have. Let's start our talk about the two themes that came up in this scenario and will come up in every scenario throughout the training video. The first one I want to talk about is an emergency support group. These are a group of people that you have contacted ahead of time to help you during the disaster. These can be family, friends, co-workers, caregivers, and even neighbors. I know it can feel intimidating asking people for help. And when a disaster strikes, people will need to take care of themselves and their family members but people will also step up to help. So I think five to six people is a good number to have in your emergency support group. Keep a copy of the contact information of your support group in your computer, on your phone, on your refrigerator, and make sure to check back in with your group every six to nine months, just because relevant information might have changed and you want to keep them as up to date about you and your disability as possible. The other important theme that came up was the emergency supply kit or 72 hour kit. We've included a lot of information about this in your workbook. The thing that's important to remember while food and water needs to be there, you also need the things that are unique to your disability. I think it's important to keep the kit where you are the most, which may not always be at home. Whenever possible, having multiple kits with backup durable medical equipment, medication, all of those things, it will help you be better prepared. I know that's not always affordable, just do the best that you can. So let's talk about some things that are more specific to an earthquake. Number one, you have to be in an area that's free of any glass or objects that could fall on you. I got myself into an alcove, but if you are able to get under a desk, that's a great place to be. And do you remember what I didn't do? That's right, I didn't evacuate. And that's because of aftershocks. These can happen hours after an earthquake. Unless you can get outside into an open space that's free of buildings or trees, it's really best to stay where you are, unless of course you smell smoke or gas. So let's talk electrical power. This one's really important to me because I am very electrical dependent. And not just because of my wheelchair, but at home I use a CPAP. If you have a car, you can buy a special adapter that will allow you to charge things through the car battery. And my CPAP? Well, you can buy a backup battery for those, and they're rechargeable and will last an additional 12 hours. You may need to just evacuate to a shelter that does have a generator. Or if the disaster is in one part of town, go stay at a hotel or with a friend who's in another part of town that hasn't been affected. So the last thing that I want to highlight is the whistle. And this is important not just for people with disabilities, but for non-disabled folks as well. Like preparedness said, emergency responders are trained to listen for a repetitive sound during recovery. I'm not very strong, so that's why I carry the whistle. I keep it on my wallet. But if you're trapped without a whistle, the thing to remember is to grab something and bang on it really loudly doing so in a repetitive motion. And that is what responders are going to listen for. Wow, that was a lot. Let's check out the next scenario and see what we learn.
I've lived in the Northwest all my life, and I'm used to all kinds of weather. I can usually get by on my own, but this storm was different. Two feet of snow fell, shutting down all kinds of bus lines, making the sidewalks impassable. There was so much snow, I couldn't even get out my front door. It's an inconvenience for most people, but for being blind, it makes getting around town almost impossible. And I have to depend on the bus for everything. So having preparedness for help really saved me. Hi. I really didn't do that much. She told me all about emergency and how to prepare for it. I thought I had this one in the bag. It was a snowstorm. There was no buses, no electricity. Seriously, how did you do it? Well, for one, I put together a 72-hour emergency supply kit. It looks like you have all your supplies. Now we just need to put them in the tub. We can put some of your personal items, like your soap, your toothbrush, and your eating utensils in the bottom. So, you're packing what I need mostly at the top, right? Exactly. So next, we put in a blanket, and then a change of clothing. Followed by water, mm -hmm. yeah. food, okay. and my medical kit, so I can reach it quickly. And because I'm blind, I had to include an extra cane. And for people with limited vision, it's a good idea to have large print or braille labels on everything. Oh, I almost forgot. I keep an extra radio with batteries so I can get up-to-date information. Oh, and tell them about your medications. I keep a seven-day supply kit of my medication with the prescriptions so I can get them easily refilled. Well, I couldn't get you because you were prepared, but what about your little dog, too? <laughs> I couldn't forget about my good buddy. I made an emergency kit for him and put it with my kit. Let's see, old buddy. We have two weeks' supply of water with your dish. We have a week's supply of your food. Can't forget your bags for your waste now. We got your favorite toy. We got the medical bag now with your medicine from the doctor. Yes. And we got your blanket, your favorite leash. Oh, and I almost forgot. Here's a picture of you with my contact information on it and your vet's name on the back. So it looks like you're all set. And once we had that done, we talked about Bill's support group. And I needed at least three people that I could depend on in times of emergency. Family, friend, neighbor, who were aware of my needs as a blind person in times of an emergency. I got these people together and we discussed what we would do in an emergency. So how would I get in touch with you if the phones were out and the power went off? Well, if that happened, I'd come directly to your house and I'd check out. That's what I was thinking. Well, here's a set of spare keys I have, and uh, I'd like to take you and show you where my emergency kit is. I chose people that I could trust that were strong enough physically, that could communicate clearly, and could guide me safely. Then I check with them every couple of months to see if they can still help me. And he also signed up for the additional needs registry. A&R is a program put together by the city and county to identify and assist people who may need extra help during an emergency. It doesn't guarantee first responders will come and evacuate you, but it lets planners and responders know where you are and others are and can connect you with volunteers in your neighborhood who may be able to help you evacuate. It's also a way to make sure you get important disability-related information like where there are ADA accessible shelters. In Portland, I signed up through publicalerts.org and followed the prompts. 
for people with disabilities. In other cities, check with your local, county, or city emergency offices. And that's how I got through Arctic Blast in 2008. What a world. What a... So let's talk about storms. Since Nicholas is blind, he had some different challenges than I did. So we both needed emergency support groups. And Nicholas was really good about meeting with his beforehand. And he even gave them a set of extra keys so that they could come and help him out. We also both needed emergency supply kits, but we handled it a little differently. So there were two major things that Nicholas needed that I didn't. One were braille labels so that he could read what each of the items were. And the other was that the items were put into the kit in a specific order to help him find them when he would go back to use the kit later. Labels or pictograms would also be good. This would work for people with low vision and also people with cognitive or developmental disabilities. So Nicholas also needed a kit for his dog. If you have a service animal or a therapy animal that's going to be with you through an emergency situation, you're also going to need a kit for them. The other thing that Nicholas did was he signed up on the Additional Needs Registry. And I can tell you a lot about this program because I run it. The Additional Needs Registry works in two ways, both for large-scale disasters and for those little emergencies at home. For the larger scale disasters, the registry works to allow planners to get a good idea of where folks are in the community and what their needs are gonna be. So for example, if we need to evacuate a large number of folks with mobility devices from a certain area of town, we will know that ahead of time and can plan accordingly. We are also able to connect net team members or neighborhood emergency team members with the folks in their particular geographic area. And this lets us know that there are people, volunteer responders, that can evacuate folks and get them to shelters when first responders are busy with the main area of disaster. So for smaller scale emergencies, the registry works by putting folks into our 911 system. So when a 911 call comes in, say for a fire, firemen are alerted to specific information. For example, if someone in the house has traumatic brain injury and is nonverbal, the firemen would know this and would be able to act accordingly. You will find all the information you need to know about signing up in your workbook. On to scenario three. Who? Oh, you'll know when he gets here. I know it's not raining, but an emergency can happen at any time. I'm here to help you get prepared. It's over. It's raining. I'm coming in. So. You just think you can come right in here I can. and just take it off the Because I Whatever, can. you just need to leave. Oh. The emergency's a flood, and he thinks he's all of that. Hey, wait a minute. I am all that, and the bag of chips. You're not scaring anybody. He's prepared. Mm -hmm. What is he doing? 
He's checking to see what's going on and to see what officials are recommending for evacuation. But how was he even... That's not possible. I took out the power and the internet. He's watching TV. Sam's looking at his battery-operated TV. He's deaf, and he can't hear a radio like other individuals. He's tuning in to emergency broadcasting, and he's looking for the ASL interpreter or reading the captioning at the bottom. Where's he going? I don't know. What did you do? What did I do? Yeah, what did you do? I didn't do anything. You did something. Oh, no, you're the one supposed to be doing well, everything. He, he just left. Oh, no, yeah. No, yeah, other, he right? just always come in here, and he just, you made him leave. There you go. Are you hurt? Are you okay? I'm, I can't, I can't understand you. So she doesn't know your death. Remember, not all shelter staff are trained on how to work with people with disabilities. Sam. Hello, I am Jane. But who are these two? Hmm. I don't understand. Can you can you write it down or something? Can you write it down? Okay, I know I have a pad of paper around here somewhere. Is that my pad of paper? Oh, huh? Yes. There you go. What I do. I mean, mayhem, destruction. Right, right. Isn't it fantastic? Yeah. How is this going to help us in a real emergency? It's not my problem. Oh, not my problem. Sure. Hey, Sam. Oh, okay. Emergency and preparedness. I see. Okay, you know what? Okay, I'm going to see if I can get you an interpreter. Okay? I'm going to get an interpreter for ASL. Okay? You're welcome. <laughs> Have you texted your emergency support group? Hey, Sam, listen, we can't get you an interpreter for several hours. So what I'm going to do is set you up on a cot, okay? Here. Okay, you're welcome. Okay, can I have everyone's attention? Just want to let you know that the mayor has declared a state of emergency. We will be expecting many more guests here at the sh shelter very soon, so please be prepared. Okay, now I just announced that. How is Sam going to know about announcements if uh, we're doing everything over the intercom? Well, what we can do is post all the announcements in a central location and then let Sam know that you'll flash the lights whenever a new announcement is posted. This is good for people who are deaf and hard of hearing and then also people who do not speak English. Okay, excellent. Post a sign, flash the lights. That'll keep everyone informed. See, we're gonna be here all night so we can tell ghost stories and I can tell you about the last thing I did and then we can talk about other things that I did.
not only does scenario three teach us tips for people who are deaf, it teaches us that not all the people that work in shelters are trained to work with people with disabilities. Don't get me wrong. When people are setting up shelters, especially Red Cross shelters, there are definitely policies in place that are there to ensure that the shelter is set up in accordance with the Americans with Disability Act. The thing to remember though is that not everyone that's working in the shelter that day has gone through the extensive Red Cross training. These folks are often volunteers and they don't always know the policies and procedures that have been put in place to accommodate the people with disabilities. This is why it's important for people with disabilities to prepare ahead of time and to be their own advocates in situations like this. Sam was really prepared. He had a laminated card that said, I am deaf and will need ASL interpretation. It's really important that before the disaster happens, you have either a card or some paper with detailed instructions on what you're gonna need if the disaster happens. Hopefully you won't be on your own and someone from your support team will be with you. Sam did a great job with that. Let's talk about a couple other things that Sam did really well. Sam knew that he was power dependent in order to get information. Sam also had a support team, and while he couldn't contact them because the phone lines were down, he still made an effort to do so. Even though Sam was on his own, he did a great job navigating the emergency because he had prepared to let people know that he would need sign language interpretation he also used written notes for communicating when sign language wasn't available. And this was important because as prepared as you can be, things are always going to come up. So remember to stay calm and just communicate your needs however you can to the people that are there to help. We've got one more scenario. Let's see if emergency finally gets the better of someone. Looks like I'm the first one here. First? Who are you? Agent Orange. FBI. But that's a library card. Doesn't matter. Mind if I smoke? Yes. Well, I guess I'll go put this out in the kitchen. I thought you were going to put that out. Yeah, I guess I did say that. You got a bathroom? It's that way. Okay, thanks. So much stuff. This is great. This is going to be so awesome. This is going to be awesome. cigar. Oh man, you should really get some water. Oh, okay. Oh, we're going down, huh? Water's not good some hot fires. And you have to feel the door. The fire could be in there. What were you doing in there? Oh, you know, the basics. Putting tinfoil in the microwave, stuff like that. Yeah, it's warm. We should go on 911 and leave. 
You call 911. This is awesome. Hey, let's use this. No, I don't know how. And you shouldn't use it unless you know how. Yes, 911. My name is Chris Collins, and there is a fire at my house. Oh no, I'm too late. No, you're not. The fire department is on their way, and we got out safe and sound. So what about your little puppy? Oh, I'm allergic to fur. Reptile? Gerbil? Fish? I have a fish. Well then, don't you want to save your little fish, eh? Oh, no, 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 no. No. It's not safe. You did great, Chris. Do you want to call your emergency contact? Hey, what's this? Oh, you mean this? It's my emergency bracelet. It's where I keep the name and contact info of my emergency support person, which is my mom. Are you Chris? Your name came up in our additional needs registry. Do you know what's happening? I was reading a book. And then the sky suddenly shot. up. And then there was smoke. And the door was hot. So I crawled out and called 911. Are you okay? Yes. Hey buddy, where are you going? Mommy. Hey look, the cat. <laughs> Let's go for a ride! Woo well, a fire isn't a disaster like an earthquake or a flood. You know, it could happen to any of us any day, and it's one that everyone should be prepared for. Let's review some of the important things that we learned from Chris in this scenario. First and foremost, if you are in a situation where you both smell smoke and hear a fire alarm or a smoke detector is going off, you need to leave immediately and call 911. When you're evacuating, make sure to get as low to the ground as possible, feeling doors along the way and not opening any door that feels hot. If you can't get low to the ground, make sure to cover your mouth with something to prevent smoke inhalation. Don't try to put out the fire. Depending on what kind of fire it is, things like water could actually make it spread. And while fire extinguishers can be really helpful in putting out small fires, if you haven't been trained to use it, don't. Once you're outside, wait for the fire department to arrive. When they do, let them know if there's anyone else inside, if there's any pets inside, and where their location might be. Never go in after your pets. Fire spreads fast, and it is important that you stay safe. Chris had signed up on the additional needs registry, and because of that, the fireman knew with his disability, he may have some trouble understanding some of what's going on. Chris also had an emergency alert bracelet with important information about who to contact and what his disability was. It's important to have an emergency alert bracelet especially if you have a disability that has communication issues or allergies that are life-threatening, say, if you're unconscious. We hope that you've learned something. Remember, there's a lot of information out there, and this was just really a jumping-off point. I want you to visit my website, and feel free to call my office if you have any questions about the Additional Needs Registry or anything that we talked about in the video. Please listen carefully.